Welcome to the Healthy Living Series, a series of talks brought to you by the University of Alaska's Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning in partnership with Foundation Health Partners. My name is Joan Braddock, and I will be your host for this summer series. The Healthy Living Series, in its eighth season, has been a lecture series held in person in past summers. The COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing guidelines required that we rethink the format for the series this summer. We are delighted that KUAC has agreed to support the new format for this series as a weekly TV broadcast. We are also very grateful to our speakers who were incredibly willing to be flexible in adjusting to this new format and appreciate the time they are donating to help us all live a healthier life. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to let you know that you will be able to view the talks online after they have been aired by going to the UAF Summer Sessions website at uaf.edu slash summer slash events. I am delighted to now introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Kelly Drew, a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Dr. Drew graduated with a degree in psychology from UAF, studied neuropharmacology at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City and at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, before returning to UAF in 1990. Dr. Drew teaches and does some research on the chemicals in cannabis and related chemicals that occur naturally in the body. She lectures on these topics in two of her courses, Neurochemistry and the Chemistry of Cannabis. She also serves as an expert witness on topics related to the effects of cannabis on behavior and driving for the Alaska court system. Dr. Drew's primary research focus is on hibernation and the brain. Over the past 25 years, Dr. Drew's research group has discovered a mechanism sufficient to drive the onset of hibernation. She founded Be Cool Pharmaceuticals, LLC, in 2015 to commercialize therapeutics discovered from hibernation for use in rural and remote emergency medicine and in human spaceflight. She currently leads a statewide National Institutes of Health funded program in hibernation science called Transformative Research in Metabolism. Thank you, Kelly, for sharing with us tonight your knowledge on the health and public safety of cannabis. So I'm Kelly Drew, and uh, I'm uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at UAF. I taught a 200 level course on cannabis. My background is in pharmacology and I've tried to keep up, but every time I do something like this, it's an opportunity to uh, remind myself uh, what's out there and to look for new information. It's really a evolving uh, field. And um, you know, to start with, I, I, just to explain where I'm coming from, I was an advocate for legalization. I'm still an advocate for legalization. Uh, I don't think we'd be having this conversation if it wasn't for legalization. Uh, and uh, so it's a great opportunity. I, I um, definitely think that the health risks uh, in a, uh, a regulated um, environment are much less than in an illegal environment. And I think that the cannabis industry is good for the economy, um, particularly the local economy in Fairbanks that creates jobs. But at the same time, there are some um, topics that I think are valuable to talk about. And those are what I want to talk about today. Uh, one of them is DUI. DUI with cannabis is a really, really interesting um, problem that I think is best addressed through public education. So it's a great opportunity to talk about that. The other is the connection between cannabis and mental health. So that uh, some people may be aware of, but um, I think we can clarify some things there. And secondly, partly related to mental health are some of the new preparations we see of cannabis. It's not the old school or just a you know, natural product um, using the plant, but there's so many extractions now. So I think it's good to be aware of that and to be aware of how that can impact potential risk. So um, we're going to start off talking about DUI and um, compare it a little bit with alcohol because alcohol is what people are most familiar with. So. Cannabis does impair driving. 
Smoking cannabis, eating cannabis, it does impair driving. And I'll tell you all the nuances about that and how it, uh, um, how, how, what we can do from a public health perspective on uh, deterring um, DUI under cannabis. But just if you consider these variables, uh, reaction time, tracking time, divided attention, those are typically what are measured um, to assess driving impairment. Uh, and it's very similar. Cannabis and alcohol are all very similar with that. So this is just, just data. I, I threw out a lot of data slides because I realized this is not the right audience. But it just uh, uh, shows that um, uh, the placebo, the low dose, the medium dose, the high dose, so all of these particular uh, things, selective attention, short-term memory is unique to cannabis, um, divided attention, uh, and sustained attention, um, there are more errors as you go up in dose with cannabis. And those are the things that affect driving. But this is the really interesting thing about cannabis, and THC in particular. THC is the active ingredient, the primary active ingredient in cannabis that creates the um, effects. And so unlike alcohol, there is no direct relationship between blood levels and impairment. So that's what this graph here shows. So here's THC concentration 60 minutes after a dose, um, and this is the mean deviation, a way to um, measure uh, reaction time. And the bottom line is, even though it's dose dependent, the higher the dose, the bigger the effect, it doesn't relate to blood levels. Um, so this is blood level, this is level of THC in the blood, and it goes all the way from um, zero out to here, very high levels of 120 microgram per liter. That would be the same as nanogram per mil. Um, 120, but there's no relationship between the impairment or the effect on behavior. So that's the absolute number one take home message when you're talking about cannabis and DUI, is that it's not something that can be assessed by a blood, al a blood level, by a breath analysis, or any kind of tissue analysis because there's no relationship between blood levels and the effect. So this is the conundrum with trying to uh, charge people and convict people of DUI under cannabis. Some states have adopted per se limits. Um, I don't think they're valid. Uh, Alaska has not done that at this time. But, um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that on per se limits. I think I still have those slides in here. But the good news is that unlike alcohol, cannabis does not impair the ability to judge impairment. So that's the problem with alcohol. After a few drinks, you're the last one to suggest that you shouldn't drive. You think, absolutely, I can drive. And alcohol specifically impairs your ability to judge what you can do. Um, cannabis is not like that. People are aware when they are impaired by cannabis, and they can make that judgment. So that's why it's really important I feel to communicate that cannabis does impair driving and encourage people to use that judgment. If you are impaired, don't drive. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about uh, more, like for example, three hours after smoking, many hours after eating cannabis, you should not drive and you should be able to assess your impairment uh, and use that judgment. But this, so this uh, slide shows, um, this is baseline. So here's baseline for heart rate. I am able to perform the task. I feel drowsy. And you can see as the placebo or going up in concentration, just baseline prior to uh, consuming the drug, uh, these are what the numbers look like. They're all pretty stable across those. But now here's the change. So as THC goes up from nothing to higher concentrations, higher dose, you can see heart rate goes up. That's the best indication of the physiologic response to THC as your heart rate goes up. And now you can see the people um, are able to assess that they are, in fact, I feel high. So here's placebo, and now the lower dose, and it even goes up as the dose goes up. It goes from 46 to 52 to 72. Um, I'm able to perform a task. This is just the placebo. It's right around zero. Um, there's not much change. 
Uh, and now I'm able to perform a task. There's less, fewer people think they're able to perform the task um, at the low dose. More perform, or feel that not able to perform the task at the middle dose and at the high dose. Uh, 31 are say that they're not able to perform the task. And I feel drowsy. This is another effect often from cannabis. Here's baseline, no, not much change. Now they're feeling more drowsy, more drowsy, and more drowsy. So that's really good evidence. It'd be great to have that directly comparable with alcohol. But I would, I would predict that the alcohol, you wouldn't see the same change as the more you drink. People don't say, no, I can't do that. That's the big problem with alcohol. So that's one take home message. Um, and so this is a really kind of a complicated slide, but it just shows that, um, that the uh, concentration in blood definitely goes up after the consumption of the drug. And that's why for driving, if, um, if you knew, I mean, definitely this is the peak effect. And it, it stays up for, um, here's two hours, uh, three hours, but you definitely have an effect in there. So it doesn't mean that the higher the blood level, that there is not a greater effect. It just means that the blood level does not correlate with effect, and that's because other factors can affect blood levels. Because of cannabis is just weird, or THC is just weird. It gets into tissue, and then it gets slowly released, and it's not really well understood, but it's a very complex, uh, what we call pharmacokinetic model about where it goes and how it's released. Um, and those blood levels don't necessarily relate to brain levels and impairment. But at the same time, if you take the drug, you can see a peak. You can even relate here is um, the, how you feel, the, the feeling of being high. Um, and that you can see initially, it, it kind of follows. You can see the little green dots. Um, the same time the drug level goes up, you know, and it comes down you're feeling high. Uh, and this is the metabolite of THC in the body, and that changes proportionally also. But um, it still doesn't correlate with uh, impairment, and so it makes it difficult. So just to be able to see some of these other, um, to explain what I'm talking about in these other slides, these are some of the compounds. These are some of the molecules. So this is the delta-9 THC. That's the active ingredient in cannabis. In the body, it is uh, metabolized to 11-hydroxy-THC. That has some uh, tiny little bit of pharmacologic activity. Um, uh, it, um, then that is also uh, further oxidized to uh, carboxy-THC. And this is uh, generally excreted in the urine as carboxy-THC or 11-hydroxy-THC. Uh, these are other um, compounds that occur in the plant that we will talk about, the CBN and the CBD. So the point of all that was that they've also tried to use this combination of THC in the blood along with these metabolites, including this active metabolite 11-hydroxy-THC, um, which is mildly active. Uh, and so, um, so even with that, uh, and this is concentration of THC in the blood. So it goes up. Um, these are, this is smoking a cigarette. Each time the cigarette is smoked, the blood levels increase. But um, they still, it, it, again, it doesn't correlate with influence. It doesn't correlate with impairment. Uh, and so they've tried to do these different models where they take the concentration of THC in the blood and um, add that to the 11-hydroxy and divide that by the inactive metabolite. And the bottom line is that nobody has really ever come up with a, a way to do it. The only thing that does work is if they know when, um, when you last smoked, then they can assess impairment. Um, but that's really very difficult to know from a single blood sample when you last smoked. So here is plasma THC again during this is smoking. You get a big peak. It definitely goes up. Then it comes back down. Um, but it's interesting that here, look at the, the peak. Is, this is um, about a half an hour. So the peak and blood levels are kind of you know, back to normal, certainly within an hour. And um, yet the subjective high can last three to five hours. 
And so that's what this uh, data is showing. This is the subjective high. This is the heart rate. Heart rate is more related to blood levels, really. Um, you can see that it comes down uh, as, you, as similar to the blood levels, but the subjective high is, lasts much longer than that peak in blood level. So also the cognitive effects last three to four hours. Um, so, and it's different in heavy users and occasional users. So here is the THC um, behavior. It's in a behavior called control losses. And this is time. These, this is occasional user. The THC occasional user is the one that gets the most affected. And so that's really important for driving, for DUIs, is if, if, if you don't usually smoke marijuana, and you smoke it, you're going to be impaired. In contrast, these really heavy users, people that smoke it every day, maybe multiple times a day, um, they show very little effect, actually. So that would be the open boxes, the, the um, heavy users. And this is the behavioral response. And there's virtually no difference even between the placebo, heavy user or occasional user. So it's the every now and then user that is most vulnerable to DUI. Um, this just illustrates again the, a way to look at it, to recognize that it's a little bit different. Um, the, uh, the drug level versus the effect. Um, because what this shows is that the effect is different whether you're going up um, or whether you're coming down in time. So the um, yeah, that's, uh, um, okay, so now this is a little bit more on the tolerance in heavy cannabis users. And this is another time, another really easy way to uh, understand the problem with trying to um, test blood levels. Besides the fact that blood levels don't relate um, to impairment, uh, heavy cannabis users, for example, people who take it for medical, purposes, um, people that take it for spasticity or chronic pain uh, may consume it multiple times in a day. Those are what we're going to call heavy users. Um, and for those people, there's actually remarkable tolerance. So this is for heavy users, that's 1 to 12 joints per day, but this was published in 2012. Yeah, we don't know the, the, um, the type of cannabis that they were smoking. But you can see with all these um, measurements, there's no effect over time uh, when they consume more cannabis because they're so tolerant to it. OK, so this is really interesting. This was right around the time of the campaign. And there was a, a paper that was published. It says basically the um, interpretation is that um, the culpability of drivers killed in New Zealand, road crashes, and their use of alcohol and other drugs. So they concluded, maybe this next one shows, um, was that weak association between cannabis use with no other drug and culpability, that is the risk of a fatal accident. So the conclusion there is that cannabis does not impair driving. Because look, there's no association between a, a lethal accident and blood levels of cannabis. But what that really means is that blood levels don't tell you anything. Blood levels don't tell you anything about impairment. And so it doesn't mean that cannabis does not impair driving. And that's a really important thing. Uh, this is just a bunch of numbers that show that um, blood levels can uh, remain high for a um, long time after smoking. So the blood levels, you can get detectable levels of THC in blood for many days. Um, THC, 11-hydroxy THC, um, and that's 11-hydroxy, and then, wait, THC. This is 11-hydroxy, and then that's the inactive metabolite. But it varies so much between individuals, and importantly, it can just spike. So these are blood levels of, um, this happens to be they combine THC and 11-hydroxy THC. But it just can be all over the place. This is during abstinence. This is seven days of abstinence that it can peak. 
And it doesn't mean when it peaks that somebody feels the effects of it. That's the really curious thing. And then after oral dosing, after, if, you, if it's consumed, uh, plasma levels after oral dosing can stay elevated for many days. This is day six. And that doesn't mean the impairment lasts that long. So I'm kind of like uh, beating this um, to death. But um, so there, you know, I'm trying to convince you, I'm co certainly convinced that blood levels don't relate to impairment. You cannot find a correlation that's completely different from alcohol. There's certainly some tolerance in alcohol too, but um, not complete tolerance like there is evidence for with uh, cannabis. Um, but people are so comfortable with uh, blood alcohol levels um, and a qu quantitative association between blood alcohol and impairment. In, in fact, um, those, were, those field sobriety tests were designed specifically to test for alcohol impairment. And they were uh, developed um, to correlate with blood alcohol levels. And so we understand per se limits, 0 0.08 blood alcohol, and you're guilty. Um, so states have tried, many states have implemented per se limits for cannabis. Some states have say, said just zero tolerance. If there's any detectable THC in your blood, you're guilty of DUI. So that's pretty harsh. A uh, number of states have done that. Arizona, Delaware, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Rhode Island, Utah, Wisconsin. I haven't reviewed this recently. I don't know if those laws have changed. But, um, and then there are other states who have per se levels. So Nevada and Ohio have two nanogram per mil. That's really, really very low. Pennsylvania has one nanogram per mil. Washington and Colorado, the first two states to legalize cannabis, um, have five nanogram per mil that um, you'd think would be reasonable, but there are, there are exceptions. There's really a lot of exceptions, and I think that it's not valid. I don't think they have really um, provided sufficient evidence to support that per se limit. But that is one solution to DUI, and that puts a lot of people at risk, a lot of people at risk. I mean, you could have somebody taking uh, medical marijuana, maybe not by prescription, um, that would have five or higher nanogram per mil and not be impaired, have a fatal accident, and that person is going to be liable for manslaughter. And so it's really, a, it's a problem being able to relate that to blood levels and how to assess it. Um, but so is cannabis safer than alcohol? I think so uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, does driving under the influence of cannabis pose a public safety hazard? Yes, it does. People should not drive when they're stoned and they should know that. Um, but can we test that with blood, urine, or oral fluids? Uh, of THC or metabolites, no. Right now, it doesn't work, and I don't really see a way that it would work. Um, so this is just some more data talking about uh, half-life of THC in heavy users. Um, so the pharmacokinetic behavior uh, was consistent with what we call a multi-compartment model with a mean plasma elimination half-life of delta one that's another name for delta-9 THC of 4.3 days. So 4.3 days to eliminate half of it. The person is not still impaired four and a half days later. Um, um, but the uh, toxicity between alcohol and THC is also shows that THC is safer because there is, it's not, it's not lethal. You can't die from an overdose of THC. Although in um, dogs, I did read one paper where a dog died uh, and it was attributed to THC as a result of hypothermia. So animals, particularly household animals like dogs, if they get a hold of a couple of pounds of can of butter, um, they're gonna eat the whole thing. And so there was one article in the literature that I saw was um, attributed to a THC overdose in dogs. But alcohol uh, has an LD50, that means 50% of the population will die when, with a blood alcohol of 0.4%. Now talk about tolerance, you read in the paper people with DUIs that had blood alcohols near 0.4%. Um, and so there certainly is tolerance, but for people who are not tolerant to alcohol, 50% will die with a blood alcohol 
4%. This is generally uh, referred to as alcohol poisoning. That's an overdose of alcohol. That's a, a lethal dose of alcohol produces alcohol poisoning. So in that regard, THC is, is safer than alcohol. Um, but still, we come back to, these, uh, to, to the DUI. And so how can you assess if somebody is impaired? Uh, well, we like to fall back on these field sobriety tests. And again, those field sobriety tests, including the horizontal gaze nystagmus, the walk and turn, and the one leg stand, uh, that maybe you've seen people on the road being asked to do this by a police officer. Um, they were developed specifically to detect alcohol impairment. Um, and uh, so they typically are not ac accurate and have not been validated for THC. So this was 30 to 50 percent of participants that were given THC and known that they were given THC. So there was no question about it. And then assessed by somebody that didn't know that they had THC, um, there were 30 to 50 percent uh, that, that uh, in controlled study uh, failed the sobriety test. Um, the standardized field sobriety test. So only 30 to 50 percent were picked up as being um, impaired. Or you can go the other way and um, change how you evaluate and then you pick up people who are impaired that really are not. Um, so what we need are a specific set of field sobriety tests developed and validated for cannabis. Um, and there's really no solution to situations when field sobriety tests are not feasible. So for example, in an automobile accident where um, somebody is injured and cannot do a field sobriety test, you really can't, uh, you can't tell. But, um, but what we do need is a public uh, uh, information, a public education campaign that tells people, one, cannabis impairs driving. Two, if you've smoked it, don't drive for at least three hours. Three hours and be aware of whether you are impaired. Pay attention to it. If you feel impaired, don't drive. And so, it, you know, don't, within two to three hours, you can start assessing, do I feel impaired? Um, and if you have consumed an edible, don't drive for several hours, generally not until a after you've slept. And um, so this is a problem, this is one of my concerns with on-site consumption. I love the idea, I love that it's great for tourism, but it's not something for people to drive to. Don't drive to the, to the spot and eat a brownie and an hour later want to drive home. It's absolutely insane. It's insane that the industry is not addressing it more um, proactively. So I'm just counting on people being smart enough to realize that they're impaired and make that decision and that judgment to you know, leave their car, call a cab, call an Uber, um, or be prepared ahead of time to have a designated driver. And again, we fall back on that evidence that impairment is not um, impaired with cannabis. So, so that's my spiel on, um, on DUI. And uh, the next is cannabis and mental health. So I have spoken to mothers who are concerned of their adolescent kids using cannabis and ha having an increased risk for schizophrenia. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And there's actually an, quite a nice story about the cannabis and psychosis, and not just cannabis, but the um, drugs that work on the cannabinoid receptors in the brain. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll talk about the role of THC and CBD, particularly what are found in natural product, the, the plant, um, and how they counter each other. Um, and that you lose some of that safety when you go into these extracts, particularly really high concentrated um, THC extracts with very little CBD that can increase risk of some of these um, mental health uh, risks of cannabis. So let's start with uh, spice. So spice is no longer legal, but it was legal for a long time. And spice came about um, as mixtures of these synthetic, they're called CB1 agonists. So the um, THC works on your brain through these receptors that are called cannabinoid receptors. There's a CB1 and CB2 receptor. Uh, and so as soon as that was discovered, 
drug companies started making, making drugs, and they were making drugs specific for these receptors. Well, they didn't find any real other good uses for them, but they made their way to the, to the spice market. Um, and those agonists produce effects that are bigger than THC. The, the synthetic cannabinoids in spice are what are called full agonists, and THC is called a partial agonist. A partial agonist. So when you look at the maximal effect, THC is less than these um, synthetic cannabinoids. So this just shows an example of um, here is a response that you can measure in a test tube. And here's the concentration of the drug. And this is kind of blurry, but up here at the top are these synthetic cannabinoids, the CB and the HU drugs. These are called full agonists. Actually, a drug that, um, or compound that your brain makes, this uh, 2-AG, is that called an endocannabinoid? That's also a full agonist. Um, but THC here, this little uh, upside down uh, triangle, is what's called a partial agonist. So it produces much less of an effect. These full agonists, this would be 100%. This is about even less than 50% of the full effect. It's called a partial agonist, and that affects its risk of, of um, side effects. So um, here is a recent paper, uh, October um, 2019, that um, talks about the risk of cannabis use and youth onset psychoses. And so there are risks. There's, there's good evidence that, um, that cannabis increases risk of psychoses and with schizophrenia that can, that can um, occur initially, Initial onset is usually in late adolescence, early 20s, before the age of 25. And those people, if they happen to be vulnerable to schizophrenia, cannabis use can uh, exacerbate that risk. Which is interesting, though, because CBD counters that risk. Um, so CBD, I, I in, uh, recommend this website, leafly.com. Uh, and um, this has a, a very um, non-technical description of some of these things. Uh, but um, CBD is what's called a negative allosteric modulator of, uh, it's actually of the CB1 receptor, but it modulates the effects of THC. So THC will activate that receptor. It only activates it a little bit, not a full amount, like some of those that you find in spice. Um, but CBD dampens that effect. So if you have a plant that has a combination of THC and CBD, um, you're going to have a less of an effect than if you take a plant that just has THC or if you take an extract that, of strictly THC. So, um, so people at risk for psychosis can reduce that risk if they abstain from cannabis. And more importantly, if they look at the product and pick uh, um, product that has a, a more natural uh, combination of THC and CBD. And so some other evidence of that is CBD all by itself is a really effective antipsychotic. So people who have schizophrenia and they um, are taking drugs to um, relieve them of, from the schizophrenic symptoms can also be treated with CBD. So this is a, a clinical trial that was done with patients that were, I think for three days, all drug was withheld, and they, then they were treated either with a, uh, a therapeutically used um, antipsychotic called amisulpiride, uh, amisulpiride, or CBD. And, um, these are the symptoms of psychoses. And so this is the, um, what you can see is that this is CBD, this is am amisulpiride, um, and their CBD is as effective. In this particular case, uh, in the uh, negative score, CBD tended towards being more effective, um, CBD here, in the general score um, was equally effective. So what I'm saying is that 
the CB1 receptor may play a normal role in psychoses. And activating that receptor in excess can increase risk for psychoses. Um, CBD, which downregulates that receptor and uh, the effects of both THC as well as our endocannabinoids on that receptor, is an antipsychotic. So it really is convincing that um, the cannabinoid system, the endocannabinoid system, and THC can play a role in psychoses. So the risk is not enormous, um, but I think that it's fair to share that information so that uh, youth um, recognize that risk. It's particularly important if you've got schizophrenia in your family, um, if you have other risk factors for psychoses. Um, and uh, again, um, picking products that are uh, lower in THC and higher in CBD uh, limits and, and minimizes that risk. So here's just an, another example of um, CBD uh, during peri-adolescence prevents behavioral abnorm abnormalities in a model of schizophrenia. So this is just data that shows how CBD is a negative allosteric modulator. And I won't go through that now very much, but if you want to look at it later on your own, you can uh, see here's a, here's a nice example. Um, so this is how much of the receptor is on the surface of the cells. And so uh, these CB1 receptors um, will, when they're activated, they quickly come inside the cell. Uh, and so you can see, actually we'll look at this one with THC. Uh, these are, this is the highest concentration of, oh, this is THC without any CBD. And the cells, you, you give the, the THC and the receptors quickly come inside the cell. And as you add CBD, it is less, it dampens that effect. Or if you give CBD all by itself, the receptors actually come to the outside of the cell. And that's because CBD is dampening the effects of our endocannabinoid. Um, and so it just shows that CBD dampens the effect of THC. So here's just some examples of labels and different preparations. Um, you know, you can buy the flower uh, and plants will have naturally either higher THC or higher CBD. Um, you can purchase now a uh, flower that has a nice proportion that is not only THC but has some CBD in it, uh, which is safer in terms of psychoses. Um, here is an example of what's called uh, um, keef now. It's like similar to what used to be called hash. It's the trichome of the flowers where it has the concentrated amount of THC. And in this case, you can't see it very well, but it says 29% THC. I think that's 0.86% CBD. Um, now you go to another preparation. It's called wax, which is an extract um, into a waxy substance. THC is very, very fat soluble, so it comes out into a waxy uh, vehicle. Um, and here now the total THC is 72% um, with CBD 0.22%. So this was, it started with a plant that had high THC and you extract that to concentrate the THC. Um, and because of the plant, you're gonna have low CBD and because of the extraction process, you're gonna have very high THC. So somebody new to cannabis would not wanna start with this product. Would not be a good idea. Very likely um, you'd have negative effects, uh, negative, um, uh, it wouldn't be fun very likely could cause some paranoia and some psychoses uh, feelings. So, um, so just be aware, be aware what's out there. And then a second point is the testing um, process in the state also needs attention. So these numbers are on here, but, and, and I absolutely am confident that these are are uh, accurate representation of these two different preparations, but particularly when you're looking at flour or um, other product, the, the comparison within those are, are not, um, the regulation of the testing facilities is not to the greatest of standards. Uh, and that's something that the state needs to continue to work on, um, but it's gonna take more resources and so um, at this point, it's more a problem, I think, for the industry than it is for public health. It could be affected by people that are looking for medical 
effects, um, but I don't know. So um, this is what some of the compounds that occur in the plant. So it all starts with this uh, uh, cannabinoid called um, cannabigerolic acid. And in the plant, it is some um, uh, metabolized um, into these cabinol, um, cabino, cabinolic acids, um, THCA and CBDA. So an important point also when you're reading labels is that um, the, the, um, the THCA is converted to THC when um, it is heated. So this one, total THC, uh, must be including the THC. Oh, this is mostly total THC is a combination of THC and THCA, but when this is heated, the THCA will be converted into THC. And that's very different if you're going to consume an edible. So an edible, the THCA will not be converted into active THC. So really it's the total THC in an edible that is relevant. But if you're looking at um, something that will be heated and smoked, then you want to combine the THCA plus the THC, and that will give you the total, total THC. Yeah. And, and again, there's a link to leafly.com that uh, has nice overview of this stuff. So cannabis does have um, some withdrawal. It's, uh, do I have this picture here? Uh, no, it's usually about 10% um, of people can develop a cannabis um, disuse order. Uh, it's much, much less than for all other drugs um, that are taken for, um, I guess, uh, recreationally used drugs. Um, but it does occur. Um, this is, shows days in abstinence. It's certainly more severe with the chronic users. You're, it's negligible with, uh, with an occasional user, but people who use cannabis um, heavy users, those ones that are tolerant for driving, when they stop it, there will be some uh, feelings of uh, um, withdrawal. And this one, uh, this table shows what some of those withdrawal symptoms could be. Uh, nightmares or strange dreams. There can be some angry outbursts. There can be irritation. Uh, again, trouble with sleeping, don't sleep as well. Um, trouble waking up early, getting to sleep, uh, physically tense. All, a lot of those same things of what the benefit of taking cannabis does, helps, can help you sleep, um, it can uh, um, make you less tense. All of those things can uh, be exacerbated during the withdrawal. So it's just to be aware of um, and, you know, understand where it's coming from. So just to end on a, uh, some positive uh, perspective, there's also a lot of benefit to THC. Here's a, a paper um, from a few years ago that's saying in old mice, um, low dose of THC actually restores cognitive function. So how that works um, is not really clear, uh, but there can be benefits. Again, that's low dose. Very exciting that CBD has um, entered uh, early phase development for addiction. So there was some really nice uh, convincing uh, data in humans that CBD can uh, reduce some of the craving that are associated with, uh, that, was, uh, that was with heroin. Uh, opioid relapse, yeah. And here are some uh, more links that are interesting uh, if you want to understand more about how uh, cannabis THC uh, works on um, the, the um, neurotransmission, on how neurons work and how the CB1 receptor affects that, and also on how these normally occurring cannabinoids in the body can affect um, the signaling of neurons. So they play a really important role. The CB1 receptor is the most abundant receptor of its family. It's called a um, G protein coupled receptor. There's more of those um, than any other G protein coupled receptor in the brain. And so with that, uh, 
I am so sorry that we don't have questions and discussion and also a caveat that I'm a scientist, I'm a pharmacologist, I study this stuff uh, in the brain uh, to understand mechanism. I'm not a clinician. Uh, don't think anything I've said, uh, don't take it like you've heard it from a clinician. Um, and I'm also not a public health uh, expert. So this is, everything I've said is from the perspective of a pharmacologist who studies the drug, studies how it works on the brain and um, what I have seen from the literature. So thank you very much.